Okie dokie. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the first meeting of the book club for Language at the Speed of Sight by Dr. Mark Seidenberg. We'll be discussing the first three chapters today. My name is Mary Newton. I'm president of the Wisconsin chapter of the Reading League, and we're so pleased to be able to host this book club for you. We are, of course, indebted to Dr. Seidenberg for writing this book, but also for his persistent advocacy for improvement of reading in Wisconsin and for his efforts to, um, to bridge the gap between scientific research community and the educational practice community. Before we get started, I just have a few announcements. You'll notice that we have disabled your mics, but we'll allow you to turn them on before we go into breakout rooms later. And we are recording this meeting with the exception of the breakout rooms. So we'll be uploading it to Reading League Wisconsin YouTube channel. And I put that link to our channel in the chat box to make it easier for you to find. There are a, quite a few links right at the top of the chat box. So um, that might be helpful. You will notice there's a link there for a recent program um, on the PBS Nova series called A to Z, The First Alphabet. And it ties in so nicely with chapter three of Language at the Speed of Sight that I thought you might want the link to check it out. Hopefully you did locate the recommended reading pages for today's session, along with discussion questions and the study guide for chapters one through three. The recommended reading pages for our later meetings have already been posted on Dr. Seidenberg's website, seidenbergreading.net as well as on the Language at Speed of Sight Facebook page. And you'll be able to find the discussion questions and the study guide for those chapters as we get closer to our later meetings. If you did request a certificate of attendance, those will be emailed to you later this week. We're doing separate certificates for each of the club meeting, each of the meetings in the book club, and they'll be coming from Reading League Wisconsin email account. So keep your eye open for that. And please do be aware that we're required to document your attendance by sending the Zoom record of attendance to ALTA. So if you're seeking continuing education documentation from ALTA, be sure to stay logged in for the entire meeting. And finally, hang on to that link that you use to log into our Zoom meeting today, because we're using the same link for our future book club meetings on October 18th, November 1st, and November 15th. We're not planning to send out any additional reminder emails, so please put those dates on your calendar and keep the Zoom link handy. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our book club leader, Dr. Molly Ferry Thorne. Dr. Ferry Thorne received her PhD from Washington University in St. Louis and is currently a postdoctoral research associate at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. In her position, she works closely with Dr. Seidenberg. She'll, she'll be able to bring some important insights that will help us as we explore his book more closely today. We're delighted to have Molly as a new member of our growing Science of Reading community in Wisconsin and grateful for her serving as our guide as we look into language at the speed of sight. And now I'll turn it over to Molly. Thanks, Mary. Um, it's just as a logistic thing, people who have videos on, somebody said they are not seeing the links in the chat box. Is that, are other people not seeing the links? Can we not, are we seeing the links? No, we're not seeing the links. Okay, Mary, I think you're gonna have to, because you sent those chats before people were in the meeting, I think the chat doesn't show up, so. She will send those out again. Um, okay, and I love, thank you for those of you that are nodding and shaking heads. I appreciate that. Uh, I've got my multiple screens so that I can see some, some happy faces, which is nice. Um, yes, so I am Molly. Before we get started, I just wanna also introduce, we also have Mark Seidenberg here today to say a little hello, welcome you, kick us off. Um, so I'll let him say a few things. Um, well, thanks. Thank you, Molly. Um, uh, hello, everyone who's out there. Um, thanks for your interest in the book and and your will your interest in participating in this book club. It's just really, really great. And uh, it's clear that 
there's a lot of interest in gaining more information, knowledge about research that's relevant to reading how children learn language and, um, and improving literacy outcomes. I mean, the, there's just pent up interest that's, it's, that is enormous. And, and you folks who are here today are representative of that. Um, so we're gonna try to help convey the information to you as, in various ways. The book is a start and, and I hope the book club is helpful having someone to guide you through it and uh, uh, the study guide and other people to talk to about it, I think is really very, very helpful to getting through the material. People come at it from different backgrounds. You're gonna know more about certain things than other things. The book covers a lot of ground. So no one would really have a background in all of it um, unless you were really studying this stuff for a long time. So um, a book club is a great thing. Uh, Molly and I are still really quite committed to providing information in other forms as well. Uh, books are great, books have unique characteristics, but we can also have materials of other sorts that are helpful. People want things explained. People want to be able to ask questions. People want to be able to show, be shown things that are hard to convey in the text. So we're trying to develop other materials and we're collecting information from people like you about what would be most useful. And we hope to be able to give you other things that'll complement the book and complement other materials that are out there. I should say, the science of reading has made a lot of advances. There's a lot of that's known that we can build on Currently, I'm trying to push my colleagues on the science side to do a little bit more research that makes a closer connection between the science of reading and what happens in classrooms. We really want to make it as directly related, relevant to learning in a school setting, assuming we go back to school settings, um, as possible. So um, with that, I'm going to turn it over uh, back to Molly. Uh, and uh, again, thank you for your interest and for your participation. I'm going to come back at the end and uh, we're going to have some discussion and take questions and do other things. But I welcome your, your, your input uh, at, at any time. We are, we're really doing the best we can here. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Mark. Yes, we will at the end of this four weeks of, or four sessions of book clubs will be collecting questions and come back and do a, a Q and A to kind of address things that are still remaining questions after we have finished going through the book. Um, all right, so what's the plan for today? Um, my hope is really that I'm not planning to present very long, especially today, given that these first three chapters are pretty straightforward and are introductory. I really am thinking of this book club as an opportunity for you all to chat with each other and connect with other people who are interested in these things, get a chance to actually digest the information with each other. Um, and then also, of course, have access to me as somebody who might be able to help you answer questions. Um, but I wanna make sure we balance the kind of discussion time and with, with presentation time. Um, so. Let me just quickly also say a little bit more about who I am, where I where I come from, what what brought me to this. Um, so I'm actually I'm back in Madison, Wisconsin, where I grew up. I went to Carleton College um, and studied psychology, and left college and worked as a Montessori preschool teacher, and really was fascinated working with those kids who are starting to learn to read. And so I went back to school. I got my PhD working with uh, Dr. Rebecca Treeman at Washington University in St. Louis, whose research is focused a lot on spelling. Um, and now I am working with Mark on, as he said, kind of projects for getting science out to people. So um, if you have great ideas, we'd love to take them. Uh, all right, so the plan for today, I'm gonna just go over a few like Zoom logistics just to make sure we're on the same page. 
And then I'm going to do a, just a slight presentation on some highlights from chapter one. Then we'll, we'll break out into the breakout rooms and have some discussion, come back and have maybe some bigger group discussion. I'll share some information on the chapters two and three, and then more discussion. Um, I will make sure that we are, you have the ability to unmute yourselves because the goal is that you will actually be able to have a conversation. And um, then the plan is to have, we'll say more about this as we go into the breakout rooms, but my thought is that if we could have each breakout room assign a reporter and then we can actually have that person, um, I can ask them to unmute themselves and raise their hand and we can actually kind of get questions, get, get feedback from what the groups talked about. Um, and as we said, we're recording this session so we can share it later for people who aren't able to make it. But I'm not gonna, we'll, we'll make sure that like, I want you to feel comfortable sharing. And if you don't want your video of you out on the internet, don't worry, your video of you will not be out on the internet. Um, so it's just gonna, my, my hope is that we can just share the, the parts that are um, me talking <laughs> mainly. Uh, just for the logistics of Zoom, for the raising the hand part, that's you can find that um, by going to the participants list. And then at the bottom, there's this little raise hand option. So that'll be however the, whoever becomes the reporter will do that. And just as a note that of course, Zoom looks different on every screen. Um, so if you're trying to find that, I'm just, was, what looked at my three different devices and where it hides the participant list and the raise hand option. Um, all right, so if there aren't any people aren't having technical issues, we'll get into actual book content. So the book starts out, I think, really nicely laying out what what we're what we're here about, why we're talking about this, what. The, the problem and the paradox is. Um, and I just pulled out a couple quotes to just kind of spur thoughts for a discussion. Um, I think this is really something that maybe if you're, those of you who are newer to this conversation, maybe haven't thought about. Um, I know even I, when I was reading this book the first time around was like, huh, you're right. This is something that we are used to being an expert on something and then that makes us an expert about that topic and then we can share that knowledge. But reading really isn't that way and trying to think back to how you learn to read is probably not gonna be the most effective way to engage in reading instruction um, because so much of it is subconscious and people are very unreliable narrators of your own cognitive lives. We don't know what's happening behind the scenes. Um, and I think that this has really important implications for instruction, which probably were apparent to you in th thinking about this when reading this chapter, but that you really therefore can't be making decisions for instruction based on your intuitions. Um, and that's why we've all turned to the science of reading. Um, the observations you make out in the classroom can be inconsistent. They can be contradictory. They cannot tell you, they can, give you the wrong idea about what's actually happening under the hood. Uh, you can have two kids who are having the same issue and under, the, you know, if you, or they're displaying the same problem, but actually if you look at what's causing that problem, it can be different. Um, but I think it, and so research then can help us understand what's, you know, leading to these differences. But I also think that this helps to explain why maybe it's hard for research to get incorporated because we feel like we are experts on reading. We feel like we know a lot about reading. We've been in the classroom maybe, we've worked with kids. Um, we've seen how it seems like they're learning, but um, that maybe is not adequate. Um, but I think that this then leads to this dichotomy of we want to value the hands-on experience. We know that teachers are in the classroom and know a lot and are good at what they do. Um, but intuitions about reading don't penetrate very far and are like influenced by your prior beliefs. They're influenced by you know what you're able to experience. And so thinking about the balance of those two is really important. 
Um, yeah, so I think like this is just to kind of frame the conversation and start us out thinking about how do we incorporate science? How do we incorporate expertise of teachers? And I think a lot of you in this group are people who are probably thinking about those things on a day-to-day. -day. And um, that's like one of the things I wanted to give you kind of an opportunity to discuss with each other, how it's going for you, how you came to this group, how you came to these, you know, in looking into these ideas. So we're gonna do our first breakout rooms and, um, I think it would be nice if we could all, they should be fairly small, so you should all have time to introduce yourselves to each other and and talk about why you've joined the book club. Um, I'll have a couple questions specifically that you can discuss. And then, as I said, if we can, we can try this out, see if it works. If it doesn't, we can change for future meetings. But my thought being that, you know, you could assign somebody, I, it makes me feel like I'm back in like in school. Like you have the group reporter, the group note taker, the so if somebody feels comfortable um, sharing for the group what they discussed or a question that rose from their discussions, that then we can reconvene and you can share that so that we can actually have a little bit of a conversation. Um, the only drawback to breakout rooms is that I'm going to show you the discussion questions and then you're going to leave and they're going to be gone. So <laughs> either have a really good photographic memory or maybe take a photo or write them down. So I'll show them to you. Um, and uh, they'll be back, they'll be here if you come back to this room. So I'm gonna put you into the to the breakout rooms. Um, and the chat also does disappear. I, I can broadcast to you in the breakout rooms, but I can't like the chat box, I think becomes a different chat box, at least the last time I tried it. So, but my thought is that I'm gonna sit here in this room by myself while you all go to your breakout rooms, if you need to come back, you can. Um, and I'm gonna like, I'll set a time limit for the breakout rooms, but then if you all start returning before then, I'll end them before that. But my thought is we'll spend about 15 minutes kind of getting to know each other, getting to know your group for the day, having a little conversation just about how you got to where you are, why you're here and, and some of these ideas about education versus science. Um, so, I think just the couple things that are important before we like move on to the more this quote unquote science of reading, this the research that is in the middle of the book. There are just a few things to make sure we're all on the same page um, about just the basics of language and maybe this will answer the kind of the question of why is it language at the speed of sight. Um, so this is a, a quote that I pulled out that's just really highlights, I think people were talking about this in the chat too, that the, there is a really important role of spoken language. I want to go. And um, we will uh, right now. get back to uh, that like a little later because we'll talk about how that it plays an important role in um, the computational modeling and things that where, where the, the role that oral language Molly, you've muted yourself, I'm afraid. You know, when I mute all participants, it mutes me. Um, turns out. Uh, so the, the thing I was going to say here is just this, this relates back to the quote I pulled out from the first chapter about, you know, that you're a reading expert and you're not an expert on teaching to read. And the same is that we feel like, oh, we've learned to speak. And then if we learn to speak this way, then we can learn to read this way. and that clearly is not the case. Um, and the way that writing has developed from spoken language is the same way the kids have to pick up um, speak, pick up writing and reading from spoken language. And then this is the, the thing that maybe is something that's, if you're less familiar with um, the research on reading and really what's happening um, in, spoken language and in reading and the connection that has to be made between sound and print, that this is something that I think can kind of be an aha moment and that um, the way that we perceive speech is actually 
impacted by our experience with writing. And so I just think this is always fascinating to think about. So this was me saying the word bat, which we all probably in this group know has three phonemes, but where would those three phonemes be in here? There's no, there's no distinction between the b and the a and the t. And yet we all have learned to abstract those three phonemes. Um, there's a, the example in the book is talking about the rhymes. And actually there's a demo if you go to Mark's website that will show you like how this experiment would be done that it's um, thinking about, you know, Lance and dance, you're able to say that's a rhyme more quickly than moon and dune because they have a spelling difference. It takes a little longer there. I think the other example that's always interesting is like, you know, the activities where you say, oh, say the word sword without the S. Most of us, if we didn't think, maybe would say word, but that if you said sword without the S, it would be ord. But we have, you know, you see the word in your head and you've, you've put that W in there um, and you say word. So that's just an interesting thing that really, um, shows up in the brain research and shows up in the modeling and shows up in the behavioral studies that there's this feedback loop that learning to read changes how speech is actually represented in our brain. And that promotes the awareness of these phonemes. And then having knowledge of the phonemes means that we can better understand the alphabetic code that's representing the speech and that it just kind of solidifies itself. Um, but it really takes exposure to spellings to be able to really break words up into their phonemes. Um, and maybe we can talk at some point about the, you know, the educational implications for that too. Uh, in terms of chapter three, I think this is just kind of fascinating to think about the history of writing. Um, and the thing I would just highlight here is that there really is a rhyme and reason to the way writing and written language and spoken language is the way they map onto each other, that written language is always going to be representing phonology and semantics. And so for in English, we have the alphabet to represent the phonology and then morphology to represent the meaning. I'm gonna... Um, throw up some questions here now, which you could discuss if you'd like, or if you want to continue the discussion you were having in your breakout rooms beforehand, that's fine too. Um, I think that the real, I'm gl so glad to hear that everybody had really great conversations and had cool connections. Um, so I'm going to, I'll put you in the breakout rooms. You're welcome to stay there for uh, as long as you want. I think maybe we'll just kind of end the meeting that way. Um, and I, uh, I'll be here in the main room if you want to come back and ask me a question that comes up, but also if you want to save it for two weeks for now, that's fine. And um, so yes, please remember to come back in two weeks. But if you want to chat in your breakout rooms, I think that that's a good use of time. So let's recreate those rooms.